I really think that it's great to have Dave, to have Don, to have Phil here, because oftentimes the work that you all do is behind the scenes, people don't get a chance to see you, and usually people are interacting with you when something's gone wrong. Now is an opportunity to actually, everybody smile. Now is an opportunity for them to really sort of talk about the fact that I think a lot of the work you do is, is sort of looking forward, being sure that we have the kinds of infrastructure and, and th foundational pieces in place that will allow the county and the surrounding community to grow properly. So I really appreciate you all being here, and I'm really glad that we got such a good turnout of very concerned citizens, and, and even those of you who came to just eat. So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I think that we'll go ahead and start with, um, with, with you, Phil, and you were gonna show us a few slides and talk a little bit, right? Yes, go ahead. First, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be before you this evening. Uh, when I was preparing this Friday and today, talking to some other people at Public Works, I made the comment, and it's true, it's not until presentations like this that it really forces me to get my head out of the uh, dirt with all the day-to-day -day operations and think about where are we from a big picture. And to be honest with you, I think that's something I and, and probably the unincorporated county needs to, uh, needs to do a little bit better job of. This is a small enough uh, group that, please, I would love to get uh, critiques, comments, questions. It's the uh, input from meetings like this that I try to take notes on, bring back, and then when we update our plans, that's largely what we make uh, base some of our recommendations on. Similar to all of you, I drive the same route from <coughs> home to work to the, your grocery store so I see a portion of the county that's probably a lot different than yours, and uh, your input's very valuable to me. I know I have a tendency to get uh, a little heavy in details and slides, and so Julius promised to rein me in if I go off in that direction. But I have three things I'm going to try to accomplish in this presentation. The first is uh, talk about our 2003 transportation plan, and that has served as the uh, cookbook for our existing local SPLOST. And I, we're, we're done collecting taxes on that. I want to tell you how much money was brought in, what we've spent it on to date, and how we're going to use the remaining money. And then in part two, I'm going to talk about our um, current transportation plan that was, uh, it says dated November 2010, but truth is most of the work was done in uh, late 2009, early 2010, and then it took a while to get the final approval from the cities and, and our board. And then the last and maybe the more important section, talk about funding. I want you to understand what money we have, have available, where it comes from, how it's used, and uh, what we're looking at in the future with and without another local SPLOST or the transportation referendum. And, and even before I get into that, I'll you may all know this, and if so, I apologize, but the relation between the city and the county, I find based on phone calls, is something that a lot of people don't understand. From a jurisdiction perspective, all the state routes are obviously controlled by the Georgia Department of Transportation. The county and the city can give input and lobby for improvements such as traffic signals or widening, but it's the DOT generally who funds those and they make the call on what can or cannot be done. Same way, anything in Peachtree City is really Peachtree City Council. And in the unincorporated county, it's the county, and the same thing for Fayetteville and, and Tyrone. So we all kind of work together. And then the other player in all that is the Atlanta Regional Commission. Any project that's considered a capacity project, which means you're adding more lanes, you're allowing more traffic to get through, has impacts to air quality. So it has to get through their model and their approval before you can deliver those projects. Just a little bit of background. Okay, the, the 2003 transportation plan um, was prepared uh, and adopted or finalized in April 2003, and it became um, the list of eligible projects that we could deliver with our local SPLOST. It has what we call um, 320 funds. Those uh, is money that was given to the cities and the counties for hand-picked projects, and that's what I'm going to show on this first slide, but the, re the majority of the money, 70% of it, was for unincorporated projects or a, 
I'm sorry, projects in the cities or counties, but it had to be identified in this plan. So anything in here is eligible for this FOSC money. If it's not in the plan, it's not eligible. So the county's portion of the, I'll say, discretionary money totaled about $14.7 million. That money was to be used to uh, implement or deliver up to 19 different projects. You can see what uh, our board did is they used nearly 85% of it for resurfacing. That's not adding capacity. It's not really doing much in terms of efficiency, but it's solving a, a, a desperate need of maintaining our infrastructure. If you don't keep those roads up at a minimum standard, they start deteriorating fast and then your cost to repair them really escalates. So I feel like we're trying to stay ahead of the curve. It's a very wise thing, but in terms of improvements, it's not always the most satisfying. With the remaining money, we're able to complete um, nine projects. Two of them are currently either in the right-of-way acquisition or construction stage, and then there's eight of them that either have no action because it was determined very low priority, or we did some initial engineering and decided it's just not worth the return, that there's not as much of a need here as was originally thought. The two projects that are underway that are still to be uh, delivered to the citizens is a small intersection improvement at Inman Goza Road at State Route 92. And the project that DO, um, DOT is working on, adding a traffic signal and turn lanes, State Route 85 and Bernard Road. If you travel down that way, you know it's been quite a construction zone down there. And I think they're scheduled to have that finished in late September, early October. So, Phil, you're for the preliminary engineering. Will you have enough funds to finish those? No, not at this point. I think we're going to have between four to five hundred thousand dollars surplus, and it's going to be a decision of do we use that for one of the remaining ones? And the number one project eligible for this money is Harp Road in '85 maybe more so than any other intersection. That's the one I get emails and calls about saying, please put a signal up. There's been some fatalities there. It's a bad intersection. But that's on a state route. And we have worked with DOT since I've been in this position, about five years now, requesting over and over. And they just won't, not that they won't. In order to put a signal up, you have to meet certain criteria, warrants, and that just does not meet the warrants at this point. So to answer your question, if we can get a signal, we'll use that money to get that signal moving fast. Otherwise, it'll probably go toward resurfacing. This may be no val of no value, depending how good your eyes are. But in green, I've highlighted the intersection and roadway improvements that have been completed to date. Uh, I'm not going to go and name them all, but you can kind of see where they are scattered in the county. All right, so that's what Fayette County has done with our portion of the 30% money. Dave and Don will talk about what the cities have done with theirs. The bigger pot of money, what we call the 321 funds, uh, the county, we've collected about $73 million over the period. And from that $73 million, we're eligible to deliver any one of the 66 projects identified in here. It's, in my eyes, very important for the citizens to understand it was never intended to deliver all the projects in here. Those total over $400 million. The expectation was even if the economy was strong, we were only going to collect about $115 million for our local SPLOS. So it was always a matter of which of these 66 are most important, which ones do we deliver. And if you follow the um, newspapers at all, you, you know the East and West Bypass have been the, the big topic uh, for us, and that's where most of the money has gone. As of this month, we have uh, 23 completed projects. Many of those are by the DOT. A lot of those projects are on the state routes, and DOT has implemented them. Uh, four of them are in one stage of construction or right-of-way. Uh, about a dozen have uh, some initial engineering done with them. Of the four that are still to be delivered, they include the uh, Westbridge Road, project that's where we're 
replacing the bridge on West Bridge Road, and there's a very sharp curve up in that area that we're going to realign and make uh, much safer. It also includes completion of West Fayetteville Bypass Phase 2. Right now, that's about 40% complete from a construction standpoint. It includes the widening of State Route 54 from McDonough Road into Clayton County all the way to 1941. And it includes what I think is a great project and a big one in Fayetteville, the Hood Avenue Connector, and Donald will talk about that more. So. Of that 73 million collected, we've spent 21 million of it, or just under a third. So there's still 52 million left. If I was sitting out there, I'd be saying, what are you gonna do with that money? This slide shows it to you. The, the project shown in the light blue are projects that are completed. And they include four intersection, uh, or eight intersection improvements that are, well, I can't see them from here myself, eight dots over there. There's a path project along Redline Road, the Jimmy Mayfield widening project, in phase one of the bypass. But the remaining 52 million is going to the West Fayetteville bypass, phase two, the Hood Avenue connector, three bridge replacement projects, and the balance is going to the East Fayetteville bypass. The percentages you see there are that project's cost as a percentage of the total $73 million. What's important to understand is even with 36% of the money going to these bypass, that's not enough money to complete that project. And it's one of the critical issues in front of the board right now. How much of that project do we do locally? How much do we try to get additional federal funding? Or do we just purchase right away for now and, and secure the land? It's a, it's a real big issue in front of us. Bill, how short is it? Assuming you use the 36%, what's the What's the remaining? Yeah, good, good question. In my head, I kind of tally off of the 52 million, I subtract off all the other projects we're committed to completing. And when you do that, you have about 25 million. It, it depends on if the cost estimate goes up or down for it. Uh, to complete the East Bypass, we need an additional $10 million. That, that is accounting for a pretty significant amount of federal funding already. We're about 10 million short. That's it in terms of a summary of this plan and where we're at with our existing SPLOST. Any questions on that particular subject? Questions from anyone? Phil, what's the main, the main uh, culprit of the shortfall on the bypass? The $10 million you just spoke of? Well, if you look back, and you're going to get different opinions from different people you talked with at the county. But in my opinion, that project always had an extremely high price tag. And it was only if the board decided to put almost everything into the East Bypass could it have been completed. But the real culprit, I think, and it's, I'm going to show it on a slide coming up, is that project does not have adequate federal funding. A project of that size traditionally gets 80% federal funding, 20% local, and we are almost flip-flopped. We're getting about 20% federal, 80% local. That's out of whack. That's what we need to work on. That's one of my responsibilities to work with ARC and DOT and get that corrected. I, you know, and follow, I'll follow up on that also. It, uh, if you use any amount of federal dollars, you have to go through what they call the PDP or the federal process and you are extremely limited in what you can do with your road. You have to meet certain environmental criteria, safety criteria, design criteria. That keeps that price tag very high. So one thing we've said is, well, give away the federal fund. Say we don't want it anymore. Then you can have a lot of flexibility and essentially design your project to budget. That's an option. It's just are you willing to give away you know, up to tens of millions of dollars of federal, federal aid. After the 2003 report that the, the county completed, the city uh, with the legislation on the SPLOST uh, that you all voted on, the city of Fayetteville had listed their 23 projects. We've completed eight of the projects and we have six that are in progress. 
the completed projects are the Jimmy Mayfield widening, which we did in conjunction with the county. And we uh, just historically we've worked real well with the county and, and uh, particularly with Phil and, and with Lee Hearn before him. Um, our uh, uh, city council and the board of commissioners have gotten along pretty well the last several years and so there's been a good cooperative effort when we see a mutual benefit to these projects. Um, other projects that we've completed, there was the uh, intersection of Jeff Davis at Highway 85 and Highway 314. There was the Bradley and Jimmy Mayfield intersection, that's over by the police station. And actually that was done as part of the Jimmy Mayfield widening project. In addition, we completed a streetscaping project on Lanier Avenue and Highway 85. Uh, we completed the South Jeff Davis sidewalk and shoulder widening project. That was just a year or two ago. Uh, previous, there was the Grady and Stonewall and Booker sidewalk project. Uh, we completed a, a Welcome to Fayetteville sign. That's out on the west side as you're approaching town. You may have uh, noticed that just in the last few months. And then there were other miscellaneous sidewalk projects, including Old Norton Road, Stonewall. Uh, some, the basic philosophy was trying to fill in gaps in the sidewalk system. And so we've done a number of smaller projects to do that. Um, just, you may have seen other projects recently done around town, and let me explain that. Uh, another source of funding that the city has is uh, impact fees, and those are paid by developers when they bring in a private development project and they want to add uh, traffic on our road system. That's the philosophy behind it. And so two of the projects that we completed with, with those funds were the Helen Sam's Parkway, which is, we also call the Southside Connector Road, and that's the road that runs between Jimmy Mayfield and South Jeff Davis. And then we recently completed the Grady and Beauregard roundabout project using the impact fee money. Upcoming projects that we are working on, they're in some, uh, some state of design or right of way acquisition. They're in different, different stages. Uh, the, I guess the, the one that's been most of the most of our efforts been involved with and what we seem to get the most comments about is the Hood Avenue and Highway 92 connector project. I've got a picture of that that I'll show you in just a minute. In addition, there's a Highway 54 sidewalks project. That's to, uh, goes from Ginger Cake Road on the west side out to the industrial park on the east side. And that's again to fill in gaps in the sidewalk system along there. Uh, kind of along with that, we've got the cemetery entrance sidewalk, and that's to enhance the frontage in front of the old cemetery on Stonewall. Uh, we're also working on uh, an improved crosswalk between the hospital and Togety Village, and also uh, some cart paths to improve the ability, without using a car, to get across a 54 over in that area. It, we especially see in the future there'll be a much greater demand for that given the, the task force area and the work that was done around the hospital area. Um, but what we're hoping is to be able to comfortably get across all those lanes of traffic on Highway 54, um, eventually with golf carts, bikes, walking, whatever, people will be able to get across without using their cars. And we'd like to tie that into the sidewalk system and the cart system over by uh, Lester Road, over by the schools. We think that'll bring in a whole lot of, um, there's probably a thousand houses down that way that may be able to access the hospital without actually having to get in a car. So hopefully that'll help in the long run. And then the final project I wanted to mention as an upcoming project is the Lafayette Avenue extension and signal, and that is to extend Lafayette Avenue. Right now it ends at the Arby's over on Highway 85. It would be to extend it across 85 and run between 85 and Church Street. And then there'd be a new traffic signal at 85 and Lafayette. Um, that is uh, awaiting funding, and without funding, we aren't gonna be able to do that project. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but this is a, the latest diagram concept plan we have of the Hood Avenue and Highway 92 connector. 
I'm not going to go into any details of it right now, but if you do have questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to get into it in more detail. Um, just let me know. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was the basic funding sources that we have at the city. It's the SPLOST money and the impact fee funds. Those have, for the last 20 years or so, historically been the major sources of funding for transportation projects. Um, in addition, we've used grants that we get from the state or the feds. Um, another potential source is the general fund, but typically the city council doesn't want to use that and very little has been used for these types of projects. The list of projects that we've shown will use up the remaining balances in our SPLOST and our impact fee funds, and so we really don't have a future source of funding. Um, I mean, the TIA would potentially be a source, but otherwise we really don't have a future source of funding for additional projects beyond what we've discussed. And that concludes now, what is the, TIA? the Transportation uh, was Initiative Investment, Investment Act. Act. I keep getting those names mixed up. That's what you'll be voting on uh, if you haven't voted already so today. I wanted you all to talk a little bit more about how you all interact with one another. I mean. Um, there, there are a number of different agencies that all of you are, are overlapping with from time to time. I mean, not only the county, but the state and, you know, various city governments and the feds. How does that play out? Anybody? As Don said, I think as a, at the staff level, we work together quite well. And it's very common. We'll exchange emails or talk to one another or meet when we need to. Uh, one of my responsibilities is to got real sense of it, is to attend the, um, yeah, is to attend the Atlanta Regional Commission and all their transportation requirements. I bring that information back and try to disseminate it to uh, Dave and Don as well as the town of Tyrone. It's becoming more common, in my opinion, that both the Department of Transportation mm -hmm. at the state level and ARC is looking for lists of projects and plans that are supported by both your county officials and your city officials. They want to see that cooperation right. from both jurisdictions and they also want to see that it's been thought out and coincides with your land use plan. So I think that the need for cooperation is, is there and growing. Um, I would just say that um, many projects do cross interjurisdictional lines, and of course we have to have cooperation. It's, it's forced cooperation in those cases if we're going to do the project. But uh, even smaller projects, we do, uh, as, at least at a staff level, a pretty good job of letting each other know what's going on. And over the last several years, we, with the Fayette County Transportation Plan, pretty much we all know what each other's doing from that. Okay, good. Go ahead. One item that is a growing need is the use of um, golf carts and multi-use paths. And I mentioned this kind of as a FYI, but also to get your input. We have several commissioners who are pushing strongly that the uh, wonderful cart path system in Peachtree City and that Fayetteville is developing be expanded into the county. And that adds uh, a lot of challenges because you're speeds tend to be a lot higher on your county roads and we don't have any sort of existing infrastructure for it but also it requires some cooperation because the current requirements in Peachtree City in terms of the appropriate age to drive a golf cart and permitting fees are different than what we have in the county so we're putting people in a very bad situation as they cross those jur jurisdictional lines right now until we get a unified set of standards and going to be a big challenge if we go in that direction. David, any other questions before David gets up? You know, I think you're making a very interesting point, Phil, and Diane, you mentioned it also about um, we're trying to make the place more pedestrian friendly, more cart friendly, more bike friendly. I've been in, I guess I've been living here in Fayette County about 26 years now. And, the, and I went to college here in Atlanta, and, and even when I was at Morehouse, I noticed this has never been a very pedestrian-friendly 
area. In fact, I have to get in my car to drive to a park if I want to walk someplace where there isn't a lot of traffic around. So I'm really glad to hear that we're actually, and, and you know, I think this is a trend that we're beginning to see nationwide now, that people are trying to make um, communities more pedestrian friendly where you can basically walk to where you want to shop, where you want to work. So that's good. Go ahead, David. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having me here to, to talk about this stuff. Uh, I, for one, do not mind the, the hot days. Again, growing up in Pennsylvania, this to me is much better than getting up an extra hour early to defrost the car and uh, snow blow the driveway. So I will, I will take this any day. Um, I'll just quickly summarize some things for prioritization. Uh, in Peachtree City, we, we generally uh, prioritized all these different projects that, that we talked about in these different reports and everything and the SPLOST according to need and, and available funding that we had uh, available uh, to try and maximize the, 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 the cost benefit, if you will. Uh, a good example is basically how we dealt with the, the 2004 SPLOST that, that Phil and Don talked about earlier, uh, how we did that for, for the, the identified projects in Peachtree City. You wouldn't think there would be uh, a lot of them, but there, there were. There was several, uh, I think there was over 20-some SPLOS projects uh, just in Peachtree City alone that, that were identified. Um, here's the, the first, first list. I've got two slides of these, but I won't go through, through every, every project in detail. I'll just kind of summarize these. We've got uh, ones that were, were canceled, basically. Uh, canceled due to the, the cost-benefit ratio issue that I was talking about. You know, uh, for example, the second project there, the upgrading the railroad crossing signals was on the SPLOS list to, to try and do a quiet zone uh, in some areas, but that was going to end up costing over a over million dollars uh, to upgrade some of these intersections just so that um, the train engineers wouldn't blow their horn. So. We said, well, th this is one that we'll, well, I think we'll put to the wayside and put that money uh, to other, other uses. Some of the other ones were canceled because of level of service issues, because uh, we, we looked into it, did some preliminary engineering, and found that there really wasn't a significant need. Uh, an example was the, the Peachtree Parkway and Walt Banks uh, intersection project, that it was basically for, for a future need. Uh, level of service and we, we reprioritize that money towards other projects. The next list you see there's seven completed projects um, that we put the money towards. A couple of them were completed by the, the DOT. The Rockaway Road realignment uh, was included in the 74 widening in Peachtree City. The, the DOT did that for us. And same thing with the improvements at 74 and Cooper Circle South uh, where Cooper wiring is. Uh, the DOT incorporated those into their widening, and again, we were able to save <laughs> save some of those SPLOS funds and put them towards other projects because the DOT did those for us. Um, and then the uh, there's an error on the slide here, the McDuff Parkway Improvements Phase 1. That was a, a widening project, and that one was actually canceled, not on hold. But then several of, of the projects were were put on hold as you can see there, for, for various reasons, most of them were due to, to funding constraints, that, that they were just so expensive that we couldn't justify spending so much money on, on one, one project. Um, an example of that would, would be um, the, the 54 Gateway Bridge project on the west side of Peachtree City that was just for that one project was going to be over one and a half million dollars. So, so for various reasons like that, we, we uh, put projects on hold for, for the future, uh, for pos possibly doing in the future. And then also some of them were, uh, we looked at and there was really not a significant need for uh, doing right now. There wasn't a lot of congestion and so forth. And then the last two, uh, is where the the like Fayette County, where the lion's share I think of our SPLOS money went was for for resurfacing uh, both the streets and uh, the cart paths. What what a lot of people don't realize is 
we've got over uh, over 90 miles of cart path in the city with over 20 some bridges and, and tunnels and things like that so we've got almost duplicate infrastructure uh, in the city that that's unusual you don't see in a lot of places we've, we've got roads plus cart paths and bridges and tunnels and things like that so um, a good point that I wanted to, to bring up here too that I think they touched on is after this year all the all basically almost all of our allocated 2004 SPLOS money that y'all had given given to us is going to be gone it, it'll be used uh, there'll, there'll be a few uh, a few small things lingering that we're trying to get resolved and possibly get completed but for the most part that money has been used and it's it's not uh, just sitting somewhere uh, gaining interest so I want to make sure everybody's aware of that that I think as, as a whole I think the counties and cities have done a good job in, in, in using this this money. David, you mentioned earlier, I'll use the Rockaway Road uh, project as an example. You said the DOE, by the way, the DOT um, did that for you. What does that mean? Did y'all contribute to it and they did the work or did they pay for everything or did y'all, how did that work out? They basically paid for everything. Um, we had, we That's had, a Check mark, move on, move on. correct. We, we did not have to spend any of our local SPLOS money on, on that. Uh, taxpayers paid for it through their state taxes uh, and their gasoline taxes and things like that. But the DOT, we went and talked to the commissioner at that time, had several meetings with them and they had, they had agreed to incorporate those things into, into the widening project. At no cost I to the city. A follow up to that: Had Peachtree City done the engineering of it, or did they do the engineering as well? We had done some engineering for some of our cart path tunnels that were incorporated. Uh, we paid for all the engineering there, and the DOT agreed, agreed to pay 80 percent of the construction costs of those too. So I mean, the the DOT has been very good to Peachtree City um, in that. So then. Moving on to the uh, projects that were identified in our, our own transportation plan, we had done a, a plan back in 2005 that listed out projects that, that we needed to look at for the range of 2005 to 2015. And this slide lists, uh, we've got two slides on, on these. This first slide shows some of the projects that were, were canceled again for the same reasons that I was saying before, either uh, not, a, not a level of service need or, or lack of funding. Um, there's a couple on here. Again, the uh, segment one and segment two of 74 widening, those were completed and those were done by the DOT. Um, Then the, the, the project on the bottom, the 50, uh, 74, 54 intersection grade separation project that was identified as a possible future project. And we had, we had studied that and uh, basically recommended not to proceed with that because of the, the astronomical costs and, and impacts, right of way impacts. And we're basically leaving that one up to the DOT to, uh, uh, to handle if in the future that, that something needs to be done there. There's a second sheet of projects that were in that plan. Um, and again, the, this shows a lot of them are on, on hold as a possible future projects uh, when funding becomes available or there is a, um, uh, a need for it. The, there's a couple projects on here. Um, the McDuff Parkway phase one and, and phase two projects. Phase, there, there's an error on this slide again to phase one uh, is not on the TIA project list it's uh, it, that should be crossed off there it should just be a, a future developer project but phase two is on the TIA uh, project list as well as being a potential developer project we've got some grant uh, or we've got uh, 54 landscape enhancements which is uh, 54 West in Peachtree City we're processing the grant application for that right now to try and get funding for that. 
and the last project on there, we're working out funding options as well currently. And then the, the 2010 transportation plan that we had showed earlier, there's some new projects that came out of our discussions uh, and, and, and this plan implementation. The one is 54 and Commerce Drive. There's some safety improvements that can be, that can be done there. And then the other three are basically new, uh, new roads, uh, new future roads that, that, that may someday need to be constructed. There's not an existing uh, urgent need at this point, but they're in the plan for, for planning purposes. And as, as I said, there's no funding for any of this uh, at, at this time, any of those, those new projects. And then as far as transportation goes, uh, I can't not talk about multi-use projects in, in Peachtree City. Uh, we've got, got a ton of them that, uh, that have been identified. They're all on our website, uh, and I've given the, the, the website address there. I think there's over, I want to say over 40 uh, potential path projects. And, uh, and again, we're looking for, for funding for, for some of this stuff. There really is no funding right now for any new significant cart path projects. Um, other than the, 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 the two that are shown on the, the TIA project list over there. Um, and that's, that's all I had. Were there any questions for me? You talk about the car path funding, or there's been a significant amount of upgrades on the car paths. Is that part of the original SPLOS money, or is it city money that takes care of that on a regular basis? And what about those areas that haven't been, that are in repair, this, you know, in, in tough shape at this point? That's, that's a good question. Yes, any paving that you see or rehabilitation going on on our system right now is being funded out of, out of that, the 2004 SPLOST. It, it's going towards our path maintenance and paving. Once that runs out this year, we're not sure where, where that's gonna come from. That's, one of the, that's, that's gonna be one of the big budget questions that, that's gonna have to be addressed by our council this year is, when we spend all this SPLOS money that was going towards paving and resurfacing, when that's gone this year, what do we do moving forward? David, you mentioned there's about 40 projects uh, in your multi-use uh, plan. Under, if I remember my history at Peachtree City, basically all the developers were required, all of the builders were divided required to build car path infrastructure as they built out subdivisions. Now that, that was not true in the very beginning, I understand. So of the 40 projects that you have listed as potential projects waiting on funding, how many of those are new construction, new connectors versus rehabilitation of the existing paths? Those in our master plan, those are basically all new, they're all new paths. Um, the, uh, there are several big ticket ones that, that would connect areas in the industrial park, uh, South 74 and those areas. Currently those, those are really the areas that are not connected in the city is the industrial park. Um, some of them are, some of them are. The, the, what I would, basically our multi-use path master plan is kind of a, uh, what I would call a, the wish list of, of places that, that we want to get to. I mean, you can get anywhere in the city pretty much to all the residential areas, to commercial areas. These are kind of cream projects. You know, we, we want to get here maybe a little bit more conveniently and things like that. They're not, um, not all of them are, are like the industrial park projects where they're isolated. These are just projects that we, we, we want to have. A lot of them are more wants than needs, I guess, basically what I'm trying to say. All three of you spoke to the idea <coughs> of what you've used the last T-SPLOS money for, and that if you hadn't had that money, you wouldn't have been able to do I don't think that's, oh, oh. Background um, that that you wouldn't have been able to complete projects without it. 
and now that it's running out, you won't be able to do things because you don't have it. What did we have before the 2003-2004 T-SPLOS? Before, my understanding, it was before I, I got here, but my understanding was that most of that was funded out of the general fund, and when we got the SPLOST in 2004, the money that was in the general fund was then diverted towards other things. So, uh, like I said, that now that this is going away, our council is going to have to make a determination as to where we're going to get that money again. May I comment, David? Before the SPLOST, we had very rough cart paths. They were in a sad state of repair in 2004, 2005. Because of the SPLOST, in a four-year period, we were able to upgrade just about the entire cart path system. And then when we voted it down, didn't extend it, you, the council was forced with raising property tax somehow just the homeowners are paying the burden and there's still not enough money there to cover all of the transportation infrastructure that we need in Peachtree City. So we're going to have rough park paths once again if we don't do something. Michael? <clears throat> this kind of goes to all three of you as well as to the chamber, but um, I served on the chamber board back late 90s, early 2000s, and when a couple years there headed up the transportation committee. A lot of these projects that were in the 2003 SPLOS project in that transportation study, uh, and then back up a little bit, the cities and the county, and the county for years and years and years, every five or six years, did a new transportation plan. Morton out the ballot and belly, put together the plan, and it just sat on the shelf because there was not any funding available. Uh, the chamber, and the transportation committee at the direction of the board at the time uh, come did our highly scientific study. We sat out here and counted tags that came from other counties. We went over Jeff Davis, counted tags, went down to Peachtree City, sat there for days and days and days to count tags. So our transportation study, basically we identified 10 projects that would greatly impact Fayette County. Up to that time, the county and the cities had not done a good job on identifying grants or other funding. Uh, we went and met with Wayne Shackford at DOT to find out how come Fayette County was not getting its share of transportation funding. And it was basically said all these other counties and cities, they bring us engineered projects right away. They've already been bought here. We want and they write checks. And Fayette County wasn't doing that and saying no to a lot of givings to- M Michael, when you say they were writing checks, what, what do you mean? DOT, that's how oh, a lot okay. of other cities the DOT's writing checks because they're bringing a lot of information. Re ready to go projects. Mm -hmm. And okay. Fayette County, nor the cities in Fayette County were doing that. So okay. we, the Fayette County Chamber of Commerce, took these 10 projects we identified and went before the city councils of Fayetteville, Peachtree City, and the county commission and brought those projects before. We sat down with Lee Hearn and went over all the projects see if they would ever work or whatever. <clears throat> Over time, that's what turned into that transportation plan and that's what turned into um, the, a lot of the SPLOS projects. Um, I, where I'm going with my question is, I get very frustrated seeing those issues being politicized and, and current and past uh, councilmen and commissioners getting uh, demagogued for projects that took plat came into being long before they were actually on the board and the word of everything y'all have talked about is not getting out and it gets very frustrating to me that the politicization of these projects that okay this wasn't getting done this wasn't getting done because it's been mismanaged politically and that is not the case it's just math you know you got big wish list here it's only going to cover so many that was identified originally in all these plans that not all of them were going to be done. But for whatever reason, everything y'all are talking about here is not getting to the masses. And my question is, how can y'all get that information to the masses as to what took place over history? 
So, so Michael, your, your concern isn't so much that we, they don't have a strategic plan mm -hmm. in place, it's that the communications needs to be. I, I think there is a strategic plan in place, yeah. the yeah. transportation plan, and they've, they've but it's communicating it. carried it out and right. had to prioritize certain projects over mm -hmm. certain other projects, and obviously that becomes political. Um, you know, I'm trying examples. to get to the heart of your question. Is it Our about communicating? Is, can y'all communicate that strategic plan, that transportation plan, better to the public? Okay. And that, that may not be y'all's role, but somebody within Fayette County, within the city of Fayette, within Peachtree City, okay, let's is get, their role. Let's get an answer. Well, one thing we're trying to do in Fayetteville is we've got a, a Facebook page and our website and we try to spend more time keeping the public up to date with upcoming projects and, and to do more of getting public input on projects before we get too far along. Uh, it's generally done on a project by project basis because you hand the public something like this and there's just really too many projects for them to comprehend and to comment on. So uh, I know we're trying to do it on a project by project basis and do a better job because we have run into projects where you know people didn't know it was going on and, and then their input comes very late in the game and it's uh, uh, clearly we have not been doing a real good job of communicating it so we're trying to be more and more aware of that. Anyone else? Go ahead Phil. Well, I think it's a great comment, and I think you are speaking the truth. Uh, I, I would love to hear what you think is a good way to get information out. Personally, I think the most effective means is for, at the unincorporated level, for me to give updates to the board. Therefore, it's being done in a public setting, usually the local newspaper is there. And I think the newspaper is the key to getting that word out. Nobody's going to read the board minutes. But if I give valuable information to that update, hopefully the newspaper will pick it up. Other than that, I mean, we, our, the web page that I'm in charge of is woefully out of date. I can get that updated, but I don't think that hits a big portion of the population. I just wanted to thank Michael for taking responsibility for the West Bank of <laughs> <laughs> the I did it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can kiss and make up afterwards. You, you know, I, I, I really think that that's interesting that the, the, um, the follow-up that I wanted to do was, um, you know, that we've really, you, you all have really talked about in detail some interesting projects, a number of things that are going on. Um, like you said, Michael, some of this stuff may have been planned for a few years now and it's, it's still being talked about. The, the question that I had was, all oh, this is interesting, why should I even care about this? Uh, and, and, and I want you all to answer it, and, and I'm going to open this up to the audience too. I want it answered in the context of someone who's, who's an, a citizen and lives here in the, in the county or in one of the cities that's, that we're talking about, and also in the context of someone who might have a business or might be getting ready to put a business in place. So um, I, I, I'm a consultant. I, I travel a lot. I need to get to the airport. I'm, I'm here and there. Um, and then if someone wants to put an assembly plant in the county someplace and they need to have a railhead or good transportation to get to where their goods are going or, or to a port, the question I have is why is any of this important? Why should we care? I mean, the, the, the roads are going to take care of themselves, right? Well, you, you sat in traffic like everybody else, I think, which is probably why you should care. It, it's very personal to almost everybody that they get stuck in traffic or they have to commute from point A to point B and uh, you know I think it's it's real basic if you live here that you understand that it's important that we have a decent transportation system for yourselves even if you're not considering you know potential of businesses moving here. Right. Just your day-to-day -day activities right. requires it. And I have two thoughts that one's very pragmatic I, as engineers, we have a responsibility to have a safe transportation network. And so we have to do whatever we can to have our intersections and our road be in a uh, condition that people expect driving around in, in a safe form. Uh, and then from a more subjective standpoint, I buy into the idea that Fayette County is and can remain a special place. My goal, to the extent that I have any influence in public works, is when you cross that border from Coweta 
or Spalding, I want our right of way in our roads to be in such a condition that you know you cross the border. You don't even need a sign. Something tells you, oh, man, this is different all of a sudden. And in, the large, in some areas we're there, in some areas we're not. But that has to do with things of getting proper shoulders, having our roads in good condition, um, controlling litter and signs. Uh, and I think that has big um, ripple effects in terms of the community you live in. So I, I think it matters quite a bit. Okay. David? Well, I think it, it matters to everybody from the planning perspective. I'm, I'm an engineer, but I think that, that more attention should be focused on the, the, the planning, because I think we're Atlanta and, and the region is, is where it's at because we we haven't focused enough on the future that, that we're so tied to the nuts and bolts of, of day to day problems. You know, that that's that's what Phil and Don and I think get, get pulled into all the time is we're in the trenches and and we need to focus more on the the planning. You know, where do we need to be twenty years from now, you know, and and, and try to lay the groundwork so that so that you know our kids are not looking back at us and saying well why didn't you why didn't you think of that you know so so I think it's important from from a long-term planning perspective that we we need to focus on that and and try and be proactive and you know not not get not fall into the trap of well you know you don't need to look at that now you're wasting money but look at it from well, we, we really need to look at it and, and be proactive and not just be reactive. You know, when I, was, when I was a teenager, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license and get on the road. And when I, when I do business in a city like D.C. Or, or New York or the San Francisco Bay Area, it's so easy to just get on BART or the Metro and just get wherever I need to go and I don't have to worry about getting stuck in traffic. So um, it, it, priorities shift, and, and, and once, you've, once you've sort of seen and had to sit in traffic like that, you say, wow, I wish there was some way that I could get around this. So I, I agree. I think that there's something really unique about the area that we're in here. Um, and, and I'm going to get a few other comments, but I want to get back to something Michael said. Is there something that, that we could learn, or are there lessons that we can learn from, from the way our surrounding counties handle things or get access to funds? that we could use as, as lessons. And, and I'll just open that up to everybody. Um, you said that some of the other places are able to, to sort of get access to funds in a way that we haven't been able. Are there lessons to be learned? And, and I'm not putting it back on you, Michael, anybody. If I might quickly comment, I'll give a good example. When we went to DOT, McDonough Road is State Highway 81. The, the state in there, TIA and their step and tip funds had that identified for 30 something years. They asked this was before 54 was widened, but they had asked Fayette County to pay for the traffic light at McDonald Road in 54 at the time. And oh, and they wanted them to pay for all the road signs. I think Fayette County had to spend $18,000 for the road signs and $60,000 for the street light. And they refused because it was going to cost $78,000. And that went on year after year after year. So they got dropped out of the project list. And that was just perennially what went on it for years and years and years, and it never stepped up. Whereas Gwinnett County would buy right away, pay for the signs, do all the engineering, take it down there and say, here's a project, can we get funding? Boom, it got put in the, and I always forget which one's the quick one, the tip or the step. Tip. The step. So it got put, moved from the tip to the step and funded within a year. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me get a few other comments. Uh, Virginia, and, and I think there was somebody else who wanted to say something. Go ahead. It seemed like it was a, a, maybe a, a great segue, um, David's comments and, and really what, what Michael's saying, um, talking about the 2010 transportation plan and sort of looking forward. And I guess my, my question to each of you all is, you know, so you came together, you updated the 2003 plan into this 2010 plan, can you talk through a little bit how you determine the priorities going forward and what are those priorities as we look out the next few years? Anyone? Well, I, actually, I have some slides on that. The, the 2010 plan, that's this document here. It's available online. Uh, broke projects into, into three tiers. 
we are in tier one. Then there's a mid-range and a long range. Tier one, for the most part, just took all of the projects that did not get completed in this and put them in tier one. Most of them are, uh, are eligible for our existing <coughs> SPLOST funds. Uh, there's a handful that are scheduled for completion. Two of the new additions are the uh, project that I think has pretty good support, and that's a new road construction from State Route 54 to Fener First Manassas Mile. That's essentially to get garbage trucks to the landfill and transfer stations without having to go down Grady Avenue. We think that's important uh, kind of from a quality of life standpoint. I think the city has some big plans for the Grady Avenue area. I know the chamber does now. Um, but from a safety standpoint and efficiency standpoint, we're looking at that. It's a doable project. We have a lot of the, if not all, the right of way. Uh, the other big one is the widening of 54 East. DOT is taking the lead on it. If TIA passes, it's going to happen right away. Even if it doesn't pass, they're saying the funding's there. It's just not so certain exactly when. I'm going to go through the other tiers uh, pretty quickly because I want to get into my summary of um, funding options. But one of the things that came out in this plan from a, a big picture perspective was a focus on instead of traditional widening projects of growing from two to four lanes, can we instead do operational improvements? Uh, I personally have bought into that and I think a good number of the commissioners have and it's not something unique to Fayette County. Throughout the region, other counties are talking about it because it makes sense. When you widen something to four lanes, it's very difficult to maintain a rural setting along that corridor at that point. People start thinking non-residential development. And is that what you want on 85 south of Bernard Road? Is that what you want on 92 near Inman? So it, it introduced this concept of operational improvements in, in lieu of widening everywhere. And it also has a much stronger emphasis on tying your land use to your transportation. On tier two, I want to note, even though that also has a very big price tag, about 50% of it is still associated with the East Fayetteville bypass. So that project, you know, continues to show up on a lot of these screens and raises the, the total dollar sign of them. Phil, how often do, is the plan updated? Is it, is it looked at every year, biannually? No, but I'm glad that was one of my points I wanted to make. As I said earlier, this plan was finalized in 2010, but a lot of the work was done in 2009, so it's already three years out of date. Um, I, I am kind of looking from this group for volunteers, and maybe you can work with Virginia to get me a name or two. What I would like to do is to at least every two years, if not annually, just polish our list. Okay, move what is, what's our top three or four highest priorities right now? What maybe is no longer feasible because of a slowdown in the economy or because of a new development? One example was in the 03 plan, I, and in fact, it was on that memo that you talked about, I think the um, extension of Jenkins Road or Sandy Creek across 74 was a hot project. Well, John Whelan built that massive development over there and suddenly that's not a hot project anymore. <laughs> Uh, so I think we need to continually update our plan so we can go to ARC and be a little bit more competitive. If everybody agrees for two or three years, these are our top three or four projects, well, it's a safe then, in my eyes, to do some preliminary engineering, to have a design ready so when money comes out of the sky like it does through stimulus packages or a new DOT program or something, we have something ready to, to take into the Atlanta region and be competitive. So you heard him, everybody. He's looking for volunteers. Now, do you have any paid positions, Phil? No, but it's very satisfying work. <laughs> very satisfying. But, but getting input, as I said, from this group and other citizens, it's really important because we have, you know, a, kind of our biased opinion. I have three or four more slides I'd like to go over to help explain or reiterate the points we've been making. From my perspective, we have... Uh, three, potentially four, funding sources we juggle. One is the, the traditional or annual money given to the road department. The local SPLOS, which as we've said several times, is no longer collecting money. ARC, and by that, I, that includes DOT money. I'm kind of lumping them together because it all goes through ARC for us. 
and then the TIA referendum. I have that in gray because it's not a given, but it has been a huge portion of my workload for the past two years now and when I look at the amount of time and meetings that we've put into that thing. So I'm going to be happy one way or the other on August 1st. <laughs> From a county perspective, this year the road department has $4.7 million. About 39% of that is for asphalt resurfacing. And by that I mean that's really buying asphalt. That's what we're doing with that money. It's not really improving our network, but it's maintaining our existing roads. So a huge portion of the county's money goes just for asphalt. 34% is for salary. That includes the entire road department year round, but the paving crew and the trucks is a big portion of that. The balance, after you take out the 39% and the 34%, the balance is used for mowing our right of way, striping the roads, new signs, filling in potholes. People call their ditches clogged up. We work on that. We have a, a very real but boring problem of fail, failing culverts and storm pipe all over the area. You guys have it too. Uh, we're helping work with our new stormwater utility department on that. The point I'm making here is the general fund's not going to build a west bypass or even do an intersection improvement project. Phil, um, and, and panelists, who's responsible for inspecting um, pipes, bridges, all of those things, uh, roads? Are there, different, or are there different agencies on different levels that inspect? Uh, for the county, we do it in-house. We set up a, a stormwater utility, which is collecting a fee now, and uh, that group is tasked with performing those inspections and prioritizing projects. What about roads and bridges? Roads, oh, I'm sorry, we do roads in-house, but the DOT does an inspection of our bridges every two years and then gives us a report card. Some uh, funding for special projects, we can get money called the capital project, which is typically low dollars, less than 50000 and that may be for a small specific project or a capital improvement project, which in general means we're planning it out two or three yards or years. That could be a major upgrade to a park, Kenwood Park. There's a push to you know, expand some ball fields up there. But that would be a CIP that we'd get approval from the board and then schedule that project. My limited experience is that we are not doing intersection improvements or road widening with, as a CIP either. That money is used to pave gravel roads slowly, um, but not major transportation projects. However, the local TSPLOSP was a great way of doing that. As I already showed, we had $73 million collected for countywide. We got about $52 million in the bank. You remember that slide I showed where it's going to the bypasses, three bridge projects, and Hood Avenue is kind of using up the bulk of that money. A lot of numbers up here, but what this is showing, these are the projects that are in the TIP approved by ARC and the DOT. And what jumps out at me on this are a few things. One, Fayette's not a big percentage population-wise of the Atlanta region, but I think we should be getting more than eight projects in a plan that goes out to 2040. I need to get more projects into the plan up at ARC Unfortunately, it's not so easy as just to say we want to add a project. They, they are out of money as well, and they have been since I've been involved up there. For the first time in five years, they're finally doing a limited call, meaning projects that are in the one to two million dollar range they're accepting. Again, that doesn't meet most of our needs, but it's an opportunity to get some new projects in the plan. So we don't have many projects, and more problematic to me is this number, when you're talking about federal dollars, this number should be a lot bigger. That should be the 80% and this should be 20. We're backwards. Even the projects that are getting federal funded are not at the ratio they need to be. And that, that's going to be a, a big challenge to get that fixed. Bill, why, I'm sorry if you said it earlier, why is that? Most of it has to do uh, with the East Bypass. And uh, it, it would get complicated, but it, it's just a matter of the way it was originally programmed versus how it got into preliminary engineering, I I'm convinced it was just really a, essentially a typo almost that never got corrected. That was six, seven, eight years ago. Now we're trying to get it corrected. And shut up all tape recorders and 
Or well, it's, it's not a, you know, I, I go to ARC and I'm saying this is what happened, guys. Not a, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, not a typo, but it, it's along those lines. And, um, and they're like, yeah, well, I can see that's what happened, all right. But you can't, they can't just magically get another $20 million. They're limited by what's in the plan right now. The only way you could add more money to a Fayette County project is to take it from somebody else's project. Right, but if the formula is generally 80-20, why would one project or one county be treated differently <coughs> for purposes of, of that analysis? I'm just trying to figure out if there's a way, if there's a remedy here that we can look at and say, wait a minute, if this, if this one project or this county is treated as an anomaly compared to how the rest of transportation is done as we know it, I mean, there's got to be something that we can, we can we, as a community, and elected officials ought to be able to say, wait a minute. Well, I, I, I agree with you, and I think the solution is just what you said. It, it is such a kind of common sense. Anybody who takes a few minutes to look at kind of what happened is going to say, oh, yeah, I see it. But it's a matter of probably getting um, the, the right group of officials from Fayette County in front of the right people at ARC and DOT and get them to understand and agree with that. And, we, and we've started that process. Uh, personally, until the TIA vote, it's not worth pushing anymore because nobody's deciding anything until August 1st. And if TIA passes, it becomes a moot issue. But if it fails, then we got work to do. Bill, we were talking about earlier about communications and how to make this easier for people to understand. Okay. I'm going to use the East Bay for bypass as an example because I have to completely confused now. I saw on one list you put up earlier that the East Fayetteville bypass coming out of the East Plus funding that was passed in 2004 for $38 million. Okay. I know on the TIA list, it's listed as two projects for a total of $49 million. And now I look up here and it's a total of $56 million. Okay. Now it's on three different lists at three different prices. Now that adds to the confusion of, this, of the citizens because nobody can figure out, okay, what project are you talking about? Well, I agree. I, it, it's a good point. It adds to my confusion because certain things get into a plan at a certain date. Project progresses. Its scope could increase or decrease its cost estimate changes, but unfortunately we don't have the luxury of just automatically changing the program funds in that particular plan. It has set periods where it can be updated. So let's go back to using these payable statement you made earlier. It's $38 million was in the 2004 number. You said you had about 25 of that covered. Uh, you're probably about 10 short. Maybe you have 28 covered, you got 10 short. So you need $38 million to do these payable bypass. It, it, that's not, um, I'm simplifying numbers. When I say there's 25 million available, that's not accounting for the amount of federal dollars I assume we're getting from there, plus the amount of money already being spent. Okay. So is that where it gets confused? Is the the amount of not the we don't ever talk in total projects, we talk in our funding from the county? Yes. And it's I won't personally I won't speak for these guys. I won't give an absolute we always talk this way or always talk that way, but you always you do have to think about what even what year of dollars you're talking about and federal dollars local dollars and as i've said the cost estimate of the project does change we've prepared separate cost estimates saying well what if we were to as i said give up the federal funding we could reduce the scope a little bit and then you have a lower cost what you're seeing here in this particular slide are numbers that are in plan 2040 they were set back at some point and it, it's not easy to change those numbers so they don't necessarily match ones that I've used in another slide that I think are more accurate more realistic numbers at the time so, so are, are there times when when you all have given up federal funding because it was in the best interest of of the project yes just speak, speak to that someone let, let, let me let me go back <coughs> we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, let me go back a little bit and address several issues. I want to go all the way back to where we were talking about disseminating information. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
one of the things that uh, has always been a problem is disseminating information. And different administrations have tried different methods to disseminate information. I'll go back to the SPLOST, the 2003 vote which created the 2004 SPLOST. There were a series of meetings that were held across the county to give citizens any time to input into what they liked, what they didn't like, to try to mold that um, group of projects into something that we felt like the community would buy into. Okay? Fast forward to the revision, the, uh, the SPLOS that was proposed. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, when we went to renew this block and at the expiration of this one. And we had another series of meetings across the county to talk about this block and to talk about updating the transportation plan. And the groups that showed up at that meeting to talk about revising this plan, the transportation plan, were the group that was against the West Fayetteville Bypass, which was in the original plan. Well, updating the plan had nothing to do with the previous plan in terms of projects that were already ongoing. So this group, the minute they found out they couldn't affect the West Fable Bypass, which is what they wanted, they got up and walked out. Now, that's the problem because they didn't spend any time and effort to have an input into the plan that's going to affect them in another five to 10 years. Hmm. So we set about in 2007, we set about at the county to start disseminating more information about what was going on. So we created a web-based um, chronology, of, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. of everything that was actually happening in the county and what had been accomplished and what was planning. Mm -hmm. Nobody read it. I mean, we tracked that stuff. We talked about in 2007 coming up, uh, hiring actually for the county a public information officer who would disseminate all this information that our perception is people don't get. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to address that to let you know we've already done all those things. And mm -hmm. what it boils down to in the end is unless something affects you directly, you're hmm. not going to be interested in it because you have too many other things to do. And I understand that. Okay? But then for groups to come in later and use political game because nobody was involved in it, it's bull. Okay? Because everybody who wanted to be involved in it was involved in it. Now, let me fast forward to 2000. People actually play politics from time to time? I've heard I'm shocked. Um, let me fast forward to... Next you're going to tell me there's gambling at Ricks. Let me fast forward to 2007, which was my first year with a seat on ARC. Mm -hmm. okay. When I went into ARC, here's part of the answer to the cost of the projects. When a project was placed in the transportation plan at ARC, right. it was placed in at the estimate that had been put on it when the plan was originally estimated. Right. In the case of 2006, mm -hmm. uh, 2007, I'm sorry, the first year I was there, we were dealing with a transportation plan that was 2004 SPLOST vote, which was developed and updated in 2001, roughly. It was before I was with the county. Okay. So you're talking about a plan whose cost estimate in 2007 was six to seven years old. Well, well Jack, we, we, we now know what the, what the challenges are. What's the solution to get over all of this? Well, there was no requirement that those cost estimates ever be upgraded. It was brought up to 2007 okay. that you started seeing different numbers because it was at that point that ARC took the position, partially because of federal mandate, which said you need to upgrade your cost estimates to best estimates when you upgrade your plan. So what's the solution? How can we get over this? I mean, is there a, a way to be better in terms of communicating? Is there a way to do a better job of looking at how we plan? Unless the citizens have a particular interest, the answer is I think we are doing or have done 
just about everything mm -hmm. that can be done, with the exception of maybe keeping Phil's social media a little more current. <laughs> I can tell you one, one thing that I, I think was very effective, and I think Fayetteville did this. Um, you know, when, when you all did the Jimmy Mayfield um, uh, expansion or whatever, you know, he took some dynamite photos, and, and I think Peachtree City's done the same thing, of, of actually, so that somebody can visualize where their tax dollars have gone. Hmm. And, and I think, you know, that's one thing that personally I think is very effective and could be used much more widely, is just a couple of great photos saying, your tax dollars at work. And, and um, Jack, and, and you all talked about the fact that, um, We've got websites you're using, social media. Some of us aren't, aren't you know, some of us are, are digital immigrants. We're not that computer literate. Are, are there, are we doing, are, are we using other channels of communication other than just electronic based forms to be sure that the people get the word out? Go ahead. Well, the newspaper I, all the time. I, I hear the, uh, I hear all the communication discussions and, and those will change as technology changes yeah. and there's always other things that we need to be doing. But let's talk about leadership for a minute. And I guess I'd ask the three of you on the panel, from your perspective, being in the in the nitty gritty of what goes on day in and day out, do you feel like we as a county, and I'm asking you to think as a county now, not in your silos, but as a county, because I don't think, I mean, we all have our silos that we operate in, but it's pretty clear from story you that you shared a while ago that uh, if we're going to depending on what happens with the vote right if we're going to, to, to move forward we have to move forward in, in more of a unified manner and we have to move forward with an ability to articulate and even champion kind of our vision around transportation and and I, I just and I know some of you may say, well, we've been through that, we've been through that, and, and I hear you, but the reality is that, that the future of our county rests upon us getting out in front of some things in this area. And, and I think, I guess I would just ask the three of you, from your perspective where you sit, do you feel like, and I'm not asking you to point at a particular individual, this is not about an individual, this is about us as a county. Happening. No, let's name names. Yeah. No, go, go ahead. I'm, I'm kidding. I wouldn't dare do that. I'm not interested in doing that. But what, what do you guys think, the three of you, where you sit? Do you think do you think that leadership enters into this at all? I'm not talking about the folks you work for. I'm talking about do you feel like we have a unified approach to uh, transportation in the county? Good question. Good comment. Yeah. You're amongst friends here, David. Speak freely. <laughs> I think we've got good plans. I mean, I think we've always strived to do that. I think it's more of um, having a dedicated funding source to consistently move forward with things. You know, like the um, sometimes the state funding for, for different projects that we talk about, that, that comes and goes and dries up. and and. I think we've seen some real progress in the five years that we had this lost um, because we had a dedicated funding source. It was consistently coming in and we had the ad advantage of no federal strings attached. Um, you know, federal money is good, there's places for it, but I want everybody to realize that there's strings attached with that stuff and it's not as simple as just taking the plan downtown and saying here give me a check it there's there's a process and it, it takes time if if you're going to go through the ARC for any new tip projects you're looking at a minimum of six to seven years from 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 the time you start the process with them to the time that you're turning dirt is that about right, Phil? Um, you know, so they, they do y'all know when they started planning, when the DOT started planning the widening for 74? Do y'all know when that started, what year that started? 1992. 
and it was just completed in 2010, 11. So, I mean, the, a dedicated local funding source like like a SPLOST, I think goes goes a long way to helping to empower the 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 vision of of these plans that we come up with, because um, because the costs are significant. Um, like I said, the the ARC funding that comes and goes. Like this <coughs> this year, they said we've had million dollars for a, for a limited call for projects. That could be nothing next year. Um, so no, let's let's hear from from some of the other, anybody else. Any other comments? Well, in terms of communication, I guess eventually needs to get back to the public or, or up to the, the, the decision makers, it needs to go both ways. I think we're good to a point where, you know, we put together these plans and amongst staff, everything, all the communication seems to be good and we, you know, we, but maybe we are stuck in our silos, as you were saying. And beyond that, I, you know, we, we try to do some things to get the word out and to try to push it forward at the uh, the ARC level or wherever the, the funding source is coming from. Um, it, but uh, in terms of leadership, uh, I guess it's good to have more or less uh, everybody at the county on board, you know, the folks who are going to go up there. It, it doesn't do us any good to have a county commissioner go and champion a project and then have another one, you know, cut the legs out from under it. That that that's um, doesn't look good in the state's eyes. So uh, I, I think we all need to be a one voice and just communicate it as, as hard as we can and as, in as many ways as we can. The, the, um, before you say anything, Phil, I just wanted to, uh, we're, we're getting tight on time and um, the, the comments that you're making are, are, are very interesting. I uh, just wanted to share with you, I heard, um, I heard Tom Friedman um, make a comment when he was doing a lecture a few weeks ago and he was basically saying a few decades ago if you were a, a mayor, governor, elected official, university president it meant giving things away to people and there was a lot of money to go around. Now if you're in one of those positions it means cutting back and taking things away from people. So when we look at what's happening not only in our county but in the entire world we're we're in a cloud of austerity. Everything's being cut back. Everything's being constrained. Budgets are continuing to be tight. And I don't think this is something that's going to change going forward. So I, I want to put in a plug for, for Virginia now because one of the things that I've really been impressed with what she's done as, as the leader of the chamber is she's benchmarking. She's talking to other people who are in positions like hers. She's looking at other cities, not just in Georgia, but outside of of the state, other counties, to sort of be able to see what is it that you're doing that that has worked, what is it that you're doing that has been challenging or that didn't work, how can we learn, and, and I really appreciate your comments around leadership because we are in an era where we've got to be much more collaborative, and, and when I asked my sort of facetious question about why is any of this important, all of us sort of agreed that everybody looked at me sort of, you know, I, I thought you were about to hit me, you sort of, why would you ask that question? Um, We've all agreed that this is important, so you're right. Where does the leadership come from? Where, how do we become more collaborative? How do we work closer together? And go ahead. That, to build upon what you've said, that was going to be my question to the panel: is if you've been doing some things in a similar fashion in the past, and we're moving forward, and you have strategic plans and things uh, designed, and we're concerned about communication. Sometimes communication occurs from unlikely sources. And have you identified collaborative partners mm. that you need, whether that's in the community or outside of the community, to help your plan go forward? And are there relationships that, that you're in the process of building that are different than or similar to those that you currently have? Well, I think Virginia and the, uh, the work we've done with the chamber is one example. And then Another one that we haven't followed up on, and it's a bad excuse, but it's the reality. It's just not enough time 
email to the homeowners associations, I think, is an effective way of reaching thousands of people very quickly. And we are trying to work and build up a database of those, but it, it's not where it needs to be yet. But that would be a, a way of getting information out. And then you could target air people in a particular area that's going to be impacted by a project. We have a thing in Peachtree City, uh, it's called Updates, where people sign up to be notified of anything particular going on in Peachtree City. So anytime we have anything that's that we think is of importance that everybody needs to know about, there's several thousand that are on that mailing list. So um, that that's one of our main ways of being able to get things out now to to, to a large number of folks. Okay. Do, do you all have Twitter followings? We're not there yet. They're engineers. They don't. <laughs> I got about two more slides. I'd like to. Okay. But well, wait a minute. We have we have we have one more question. I wanted to get get a comment here. Yeah, I, I Your name is Mike. 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 Uh, and I, I was just curious. Looking at the list, I'm familiar with most of those products that's on there. But I want to I want to kind of specifically ask about number four uh, because the transit word has kind of been a very politicized word uh, with the giving vote. So I was curious what that project was exactly. That's money that's available to every county in the Atlanta region for various tran uh, transit projects. And traditionally, Fayette County does not take advantage of it, and it's reallocated to our neighbors. Uh, we can use it, though, with Fayette Senior Services. Um, and th they have used it in the past, and I think we're looking at ways to expand and get more of it to help with fuel and drivers. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was it. I wanted to ask because I, 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 probably a few folks were wondering that, but we see the I have the meetings I've attended. Transit is a hot topic, but I have yet to hear anybody speak anything but favorably for additional senior services and those with handicaps. Since I'm going to go ahead, since you're up can, there. Can I, can I address the, you were talking earlier about the number of projects and dollars and philosophy. Can I address that, please? Because I, I think people really kind of need to understand that if you look at any one particular year, you have to understand that the metro Atlanta region only has X dollars available, and it is allocated by ARC to all jurisdictions. So and ARC is the Atlanta Regional, Regional Commission. Commission. The, mm -hmm. the one thing I think would probably be the simplest explanation is if, if you and I had a project and there were each $50 million, and the region only collects $30 million a year, then if we're going to do a $50 million project, one of us has got to give up money for a year so that it can, the project can get done so that the next year the other jurisdiction gets the project done. It's like sharing resources across boundaries. A lot of what you see here is exactly that going on across the Atlanta region, where one county or city will get more projects this year and less projects next year. One of the things that we tried to do when we put projects in the, the funding at ARC is we tried to eliminate putting small dollar projects in there. Mm. The reason is obvious, is that we are a small county. If we put small projects in there, we will wind up funding for small projects and never have the money to fund a big project. So our theory was that if we put big projects in this plan, then we may not get one much for a year or two. And if you look at year one and two, and then you pop up to three and get 44 million, and then it drops down. That's the whole idea between trying to run projects through the ARC is to get the big projects handled because the smaller projects Maybe there's a different way for us to handle them, but we know for certain that we cannot handle the big projects. Okay, Jack, we got it. Got it. Thank you. Go ahead. You wanted to go through a few more slides. Thank you for your comments. That's Plan 2040 has some opportunities. And the, the last one is the TIA referendum, a summary of numbers you may or may not be familiar with. Estimated sales taxes collected from the county is going to be about $190 million. The discretionary return 
which is a great category because it's money that's split among the cities and counties for almost any transportation related project, 45.6. There's 175 million of projects directly in Fayette County that we're the sponsor of, and then an additional 41 million of projects that are on our border or just outside our border. This ex excludes federal funds that would be added to those projects, and I think there's about an additional, oh boy, I'm not, I think an additional 80 million or so of federal dollars that would be added in there. In summary, to put it in perspective, the, the blues represent the amount of money associated with the TIA talk. The purple there is kind of the county funds that go to our year, uh, year and year um, maintenance, paving our roads. The yellow, you're seeing what we have remaining of our local splost. And the lime green is the, the plan 2040. The only purpose of this slide is to help give you an order of magnitude associated with these different funding sources. All right, that's all I had, sir. Okay. And, and <laughs> actually, I, I don't feel like I gave a real sufficient answer to your good question about the East Bypass, and either after this meeting or tomorrow, I'd, we can get into the details if curiosity takes you there. Okay. So uh, have, uh, go ahead. I have a question, I guess, for, for the three of you as, as our, you know, really transportation experts. And one of the things I really want to know in each of your jurisdictions is, you know, when you really look at it, what do you think are the top three priorities, most important things that need to happen Good question. in your jurisdiction? Good okay. question. We have... And, and how's it going to be? We have several uh, operational safety projects that, that I talked about, the 54 and Commerce Drive one, um, which is not funded at all uh, right now. Um, that would be one of my, my top ones. The other ones, uh, some intersections in North Peachtree Parkway that are partially funded by the, the SPLOST, and we're trying to, to work out some other funding opportunities there. And then, uh, like I said, connecting our um, industrial park to the cart path system. Just off the top of my head, those are the, the, the biggest things for us right now. And right now, as far as once you finish the current SPLOS funds, did, did I hear you that, that really there are no general funds for you as far as resurfacing? Is that, is that right? That's correct. That's what council is going to be looking at during this budget process as to where can we make that money up? Well, I think for Fayetteville, the, the Hood 92 connector would be number one. Uh, this widening Highway 85 on the south side of Fayetteville from Grady down to Bernard Road would be number two. And one that we're constantly working on is what to do with the traffic downtown here. There's been a number of options thrown around. I guess the latest being, just <laughs> give you something to think about, re reversing the one-way pairs in order to uh, eliminate the left turn in the short segment, well, right outside here. Um, it's kind of an out-of-the-box sort of thought, but it is actually something the folks at DOT looked at and said, well, we don't hate it. So it may have some potential, but that's something we're going to try to pursue in the future. No, Don, just a big traffic circle around the corner. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, in my eyes, a little higher level would be a, we don't have interstate in Fayette County, so we have to fight and preserve our state routes. They are our main, our lifeline in and out of the county. So we need to get the, uh, make sure that those are maintained properly and widened as needed. Number two is improving interstate access, whether we're talking 74 and I-85 or getting better access to State Route 138. And we're already seeing DOT help us by going east into uh, Clayton. And then number three is focus comprehensively on safety and operational improvements. I think we can do an awful lot on our intersection improvements, adding a few select passing lanes without having to widen a lot of roads. Uh, I'm a big fan of roundabouts. The one you guys did, I think, uh, worked very well. And there's opportunities in the county, I think, for those to help from a safety and aesthetic standpoint. Okay. 
Good. And then my second question is really for, for the audience. I think the elephant in the room is sort of that feeling of, you know, government accountability, stewardship of funds. And, you know, as, as you all have listened to the conversation tonight or have had the communications, I'm sort of curious how, how do we as sort of the business community make that judgment on the stewardship of our funds and, and the projects and the priorities? How are they doing? Should we leave the room? <laughs> <laughs> Good comment. Yeah, well, 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 let me hear from, go ahead. And, and then we'll get to you, Jack. These gentlemen have done an admirable job. Um, and I, I think it's been here for a long time. Yeah. Uh, Jack, I think you need to speak up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Think to be able to support these gentlemen and support our county goes to what this gentleman said is it comes from leadership and the leadership in this county politics is politics so you don't have leaders come and go and, and it, it's going to be up and down from year to year and election to election something that is constant is our business community and the leadership needs to come out of this chamber and you got to have the the guts to get up and stand for what the business community and what the community needs as far as infrastructure roads hospitals uh, the chamber has been that leader in the past and it needs to continue to be the leader so you got to step up you got to be the one to get out on the front and say this is what we stand for this is what we're going to support and you need to let the community know that because the community wants to have a leader mm -hmm. and y'all have the opportunity right here and this group to do that. Good, good. Any, anyone else? Any other comments or questions? Go ahead, Jack. One, one final comment is that I want to be sure that the group understands that we've had a history in Fayette County of being planners, and we have planned uh, way back in the 70s and forward. Uh, Mike mentioned uh, Morton Alabama, which was the first official road uh, plan in the county. So we've had a history of that. Mm -hmm. But all of that planning is for naught if there's no implementation. And it takes funding to do implementation. And there's only two sources of funding. One is internal to the county and one is semi-external. The internal is property tax and the semi-external is sales tax. Only because roughly about 25 to 35% of sales tax comes from people who shop in our county from out of the county. So that's the primary things that we can deal with. And in planning, we have had the opportunity to have some guys historically think out of the box. And just to give you a couple of examples, we tried to get DOT interested in taking 279 and extending it into what our road network said was the East Fayetteville Bypass and taking it all the way around to Highway 92 on the south. We tried to get them to reroute 92 down the West Fayetteville Bypass. So the state would pick up the actual cost of construction and the cost of maintenance. Uh, so there have been a lot of things that have been proposed that are outside the box thinking in an effort to try to move us forward, but it all rests upon funding. Hmm. We don't have the leadership willing to determine that we need the funding and push some method of getting it. All the plans in the world will go nowhere. Hmm. Good comments. Anyone else? Any other comments? Does our panel have anything else they'd like to say as closing remarks? I, I would like to recognize and thank, I've been without uh, an assistant in public works for several months now. and. Laura G, I'm still not familiar with last name, starts Thursday, but she came to get familiar with the uh, wow. job, so I appreciate her coming here wow. and getting plugged in. <laughs> okay, I, I, any other closing remarks, Don? Just, just thanks for uh, having us. Okay. Thank you all for being great panelists. Thank you all for being a very professional and polite audience, and I think we all got a lot out of this. Thank you.